Hello, everyone. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, real-time network policy checking using uh, header space analysis. This is a joint work uh, with, uh, with Michael, James, uh, Professor George Vargas, my advisor, Nick, and my mentor at Google, uh, Scott White. So we all know that network debugging and verification is a hard problem. It's hard because the forwarding state of network is hard to analyze. So the forwarding state of network is a set of forwarding rules installed in forwarding tables of switches, routers, and other networking boxes that overall decide how an incoming packet is processed by the box and sent to an output port. And these forwarding rules are distributed across multiple tables uh, on multiple boxes that overall determine the end-to-end -end behavior of networks. The forwarding state is hard to analyze because, first of all, it's distributed across multiple tables and boxes, and as a result, it's harder to understand the overall system behavior. Second, it's written to network by multiple independent writers, uh, such as different instances of different protocols or even manually by network administrators. And these independently written state may interact in complex way that leads to un unforeseen results. Also, the forwarding state is presented in different formats by different vendors, which make it harder to understand by, by human beings. And finally, the forwarding state is not directly controllable or observable by, by network admins. And as you can see, this forwarding state is not constructed in a way that lends itself well to checking and verification, and that's why uh, network debugging is, is hard. Last year, uh, I talked about a tool, a snapshot-based tool called Hassle that uses header space analysis uh, as its foundation. Uh, so it uses header space analysis to create a model of the network and then use that to, to check uh, network properties. So the tool basically gets a complete snapshot of all the forwarding states in the network, convert that into a format uh, that represents each box using a transfer function, and then uh, uses that model to check properties, such as can host state talk to be in the network, or is there any uh, loop in the network. However, we know that network state changes all the time. So rules may get added to the network or get deleted from the network, or even a batch of rules may get added and deleted at the same time, and as a result, network state may change from uh, one state to the other, and these changes always has the potential of breaking things and uh, making policy violations. Today, I want to talk about a new approach to, uh, to network uh, verification that tries to verify a stream of network update as it happens in the network in real time and, and make sure that it's not violating any of the network policy or invariants. More specifically, I want to design a, mo a new model of the network to which we apply this stream of network updates along with a set of policy and invariants that we want to check on the network and then the system constantly give us a yes, no answer to each of those policies as they are getting violated. And if we do that, then uh, we, can, uh, we can prevent errors before they happen or we can uh, raise an alarm as soon as something goes, uh, uh, goes wrong in the network. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I will introduce our real-time network policy checking tool called NetPlumber. I will specifically talk about how it works, how we can uh, check policy using NetPlumber, and how we can parallelize it. And then I will talk about evaluation of NetPlumber on Google WAN network, and then I conclude my talk. So the system that we built for, uh, for real-time policy checking called NetPlumber, uh, it runs in a single or cluster of machines uh, in the network and try to verify the, the state changes against the policy in real time. Uh, it's best suited for software-defined networks uh, because in SDN, the interface between the controller and the switches is a logically centralized location to, to see all the state changes that happen in the network. So uh, NetPlumber can tap into this communication and get a stream of state changes, such as installation of new rules or removal of rules or link up, link down events in the network and verify them in real time. It can potentially be used in conventional network uh, by, by somehow getting that stream of state changes. Uh, one way to implement that would be through a SNMP trap or even by frequently polling the state from the network, but as you can guess, it's not the most efficient implementation uh, of this. 
So internally, NetPlumber creates a dependency graph of all forwarding rules in the, in the network and try, that, uh, and try to verify policy using that dependency graph. So in this graph, nodes are forwarding rules in the network and directed edges in the graph represent the next hop dependency of these rules. So what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean rule R1 in switch one has a next hop dependency to rule R2 in switch two if first of all switch one and switch two are connected by a physical link and second, the output headers of uh, rule R1 has an intersection with the input headers of rule R2. This means that there exists at least one packet that can be processed by rule R1, sent to the next hub, and processed by rule R2. So if we look at these directed edges across the graph uh, in, in the, in the uh, entire dependency graph, it shows all the possible paths of flow in, in the network. So to understand how NetPlumber works, let's run through a simple example here consisting of four boxes. So NetPlumber look at the forwarding uh, state of uh, all these boxes and for each rule it creates a node in the uh, dependency graph. Each of these squares represent a uh, 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 node in the graph. So I'm completely showing a visual representation of these rules here. Uh, first of all, each rule is, uh, uh, each header is, is limited to only four uh, bits and the way that I encode uh, this is that uh, for each bit, we have two squares. The upper square represents the possibility of taking value zero and the lower uh, for, for value one. So for example, a structure like this will, will show a zero one XX uh, header. Uh, so as you can, uh, as you can see, uh, this top rule here is matching on uh, zero, uh, on, on one zero zero uh, one header and forward that to the green box. The second rule match on uh, zero one XX and rewrite it to 001x and forward it to the green rule and so on. So this is just uh, the, the notation that we use here. So NetPlumber looks at all these forwarding states across the, the network and for all of them it creates a, a, a node in the graph. And then it connects these nodes using these directed edges. Uh, so for example, we have this directed edge from, uh, from the top blue to the top uh, uh, green node because uh, the output headers of the, uh, of the blue rule has some intersection with the input header of the uh, green node. And so by looking at the other uh, directed edges, we can, we can create this uh, dependency graph. Also, each rule uh, keeps a pointer to the higher priority rule within the same table uh, that, uh, that has uh, some intersection on the, on the match side, meaning that there are some packets that would match on that higher priority rule uh, that would otherwise match on the lower priority rule. So we keep track of these and, you, and we'll see uh, how this is uh, useful uh, in, the, in the later slides. So once we have this structure, we can use that to check policies uh, in the network. Uh, the simplest one, finding reachability between uh, two nodes. Uh, imagine you wanna find reachability from A to B. All we need to do is to connect a source node in the, in the location of source and the probe node uh, in the location of destination and then uh, the source node pushes an old wildcard flow through this dependency graph. I should emphasize that NetPlumber is a tool that's running on the side of the network and try to analyze the network as it changes. It's not actually sending any packet in, in the network, it's just kind of a simulation of network is running on the side. So it pushes this all wildcard flow through the, uh, through the rules and the, the, the flow gets processed by those rules. And the reason that it sends the old wildcard flow is that uh, those, those old wildcard flows represent the entire set of packet headers that A can possibly generate. So by, by, by doing that, we are uh, examining all the possibilities here. So after we do that, uh, we, we get the packets at the output of those rules and we just keep pushing these flows through the dependency graph and process them at each node. Note that the flows are, are propagating along the directed edges in, in this graph. And once the flow reaches to the, uh, to the final destination, we have find uh, reachability from A to B. Uh, these two uh, headers at the bottom uh, uh, shows those flows. Now imagine uh, that we change this network and add a rule uh, to, the, to the green box at the top. Uh, that's where this dependency graph actually helps to update the, the, the result uh, in, in real time. So to do that change, first of all, we need to uh, create these, uh, uh, 
these directed edges in the network and connect this newly added rule to the rest of the uh, rest of the dependency graph. And uh, these highlighted edges uh, represent uh, those dependencies. Now we can get the flow from the uh, previous hop node, process it by the, uh, by the new rule, and then just keep propagating it throughout the dependency graph all the way to the destination. However, we need to take care of another thing here. And uh, that's the intra-table dependency of these two uh, green rules. The idea here is that the top green rule now has priority of processing some of the packets that were previously matching on this second green rule. So uh, we need to subtract the effect from the flow that's going through this bottom path. And once we do subtract that, we see that actually all that flow is now going through the top path and, and uh, uh, not, not through the second path. And at this point, we have actually found the updated reachability results. So the probe node that I uh, talked about uh, up until now is in perfect position to check policies in the network. Imagine we have a policy that says packets with a header 0, 0, uh, 1, 0 uh, should go through the red box before reaching to the destination. Uh, probe node can easily check that policy because first of all, it's receiving all the possible flows from the source to the, to the destination. And second, it has the complete flow history of each of those flows because it knows uh, what the flow looks like at each, at each hop. So it can just look at that uh, flow history that's highlighted here and verify that it's actually going through the red box and uh, it can uh, assert that the policy has been checked. Now imagine that uh, we decide to remove that bottom uh, uh, blue rule here. Uh, again, NetPlumber can easily update the result by removing the flow that's going through this rule and eliminating it from the dependency graph and then removing this rule. But at this point, we have violated the policy and uh, the probe node uh, raised an alarm for, for us and uh, calls a fu callback function so we can react to this violation. So uh, now let's look at uh, a few examples of how we can actually implement uh, more complicated policies using NetPlumber. Imagine we have a network like this whose dependency graph looks like this. Uh, obviously the dependency graphs is more complicated than the, than the network graph itself because each rule represents a node in this dependency graph. And imagine the policy that we wanna check is that every uh, guest can ac uh, cannot access uh, server S. Uh, to check for that, all we need to do is to connect two uh, source nodes in the location of guests in their dependency graph and the probe node in the location of server in the dependency graph, and then program the, the probe node to raise an alarm whenever it sees any flows coming from those uh, uh, source nodes. And the way that we can, we can program this probe node to check for this policy is via a language uh, we described in the paper called Floex. Uh, effectively, it provides a regular expression-like uh, language on the header and the path of flow, so we can program it to check uh, all the flows and check that the path of all those flows are not starting from G1 and G2, uh, which are the, uh, the two uh, ports on which we have guests. Uh, another example, uh, if we wanna check in this network that the uh, client uh, to server communication doesn't go through uh, more than uh, five, uh, four hops in the, in the network, all we need to do is to connect a source node uh, generating the, the desired traffic and the probe node at the location of the server and then uh, ask the probe to check for this policy that the, all, the head, all the HTTP header are going through one, two, uh, three, or four hops. Uh, and finally, a last, uh, a last policy that we wanna check is that traffic from client C to server S uh, don't go through uh, more than, uh, should, should go through the middle box M to check for that, uh, we again connect a source node in the location of client, a probe node in the location of server, and uh, ask the, the, the probe uh, to check that the path of all the flows that start from C is actually going through M. So now let's review why the dependency graphs helped with the, with the real-time policy checking. It helped because of the incremental updating, because whenever something changes, we only have to trace through the dependency subgraph that's affected by, by an update, and we don't need to recompute everything from scratch. 
It helped with the flexible policy expression because the probe and source node could, are, are flexible to place and configure and we can, we can implement a lot of policy by that. It also helps with the parallelization because now we can partition the dependency graph into clusters that has minimum interaction with each other and then run them in, in parallel. I'm not going to explain how we can do the parallelization, but uh, intuitively if we have this dependency graph, uh, we find out the rules that has dependency to each other and then separate them out into two disjoint clusters and run them in two different uh, uh, instances of NetPlumber. Of course, our rules that are violating this clustering constraint, those rules should be replicated across both of these uh, clusters to, to fully represent the meshes. So uh, I will briefly talk about the evaluation of NetPlumber on Google WAN. Uh, so uh, Google WAN is the inter-data center network uh, for Google, connecting Google data centers uh, worldwide. It's the largest deploy SDN that's running OpenFlow and uh, it has about 143, 143K OpenFlow rules and uh, you see the, the topology of network there. So the policy that we checked on this network is that all 52 edge switches can talk to each other which translate to more than 2,500 pairwise reachability checks. To check for that, we connect the source and the probe node to each of those edge switches, the source node injecting or, or pushing on all wildcard flow, and the probe node checking that it's receiving uh, those flows from every other switches. And then uh, we use two snapshots that are taken six weeks apart. Uh, use the first one to load the net plumber and the second and the diffs as the, and the, as the incremental update and verify that during that time the, the, uh, the reachability has been maintained. I should emphasize that Google WAN is more interesting from a scale point of view. Uh, there's not that much interesting policy going on here. Uh, so we are mostly focusing on how NetPlumber scales uh, here. So uh, this graph shows the runtime of uh, uh, NetPlumber. Uh, on Google WAN, the x-axis is the runtime in millisecond, and that's the log axis, and the y-axis is the CDF of runtime per, per rule update. As you can see, uh, about 60% of rule changes could be verified in less than one millisecond, and about 95% of them can be verified in less than 10 millisecond. There's this, uh, there's this tail that take longer to verify, and those are the default or aggregate rules that adding or removing them requires a lot of changes in the, in the dependency graph. And just as a point of reference, if we wanted to do the same thing using the offline checking tool, uh, it would be hundreds of seconds, a point way over there. Also another observation is that by increasing the number of instances of NetPlumber, uh, the, the, the runtime kind of uh, start getting better and better beyond some point. After about five instances for this uh, Google van, we are not getting much benefit from parallelization. And the, the reason for that is that, the, uh, is that the dependency graph for Google has about five natural clusters. And if we try to go beyond that, we end up just replicating rules uh, across these clusters and we are not getting much benefit from the parallelization. Uh, as another example, we, we did a benchmarking test uh, for a single pairwise reachability check across three networks, Google, Stanford, and Internet2. As you can see, uh, the rule update time is well beyond uh, one millisecond in all these networks. However, link update times take a uh, longer time, it's about a few seconds. And the reason for that is that adding or removing links change a, lo a lot of things in the dependency graph, so it takes longer to verify. And uh, that, that should be okay because link changes are not that uh, frequent in the network, so uh, we, could, uh, we could still use NetPlumber in most of the networks. However, if the network is kind of like uh, energy uh, efficient network that you know, turn on and off the, the links, then NetPlumber may not be a good tool there. So to conclude my talk, uh, I talked about the design and implementation of a protocol independent system for real time network policy checking. Uh, the key component of the system was a dependency graph of all forwarding rules that shows all the paths in the network. It helped with the incremental update because we had to only trace through the dependency subgraph affected by a change. It helped with the policy, with flexible policy expression, and it helped with parallelizing uh, NetPlumber by creating uh, independent clusters. With that, I want to finish my talk and open to questions.
Hi, I like this uh, emphasis on verification that we have here at NSDI this year. Um, I wonder if you wanted to compare and contrast your work with the, uh, the earlier paper on, on Veriflow and, and try and give us a sense of, of how they're... Uh, uh, so uh, I think performance-wise, they're kind of uh, equivalent in terms of runtime. Uh, one thing about the, the net plumber is that it can, it can handle any sort of uh, rule. So I think with Veriflow, we could only have rules that are just forwarding packets here. We can have any action. And uh, uh, this is, I think, the, the, the major uh, difference. I believe the, 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 other, uh, the other main difference is that this is kind of independent of where the wildcard is and, and everything. So you can have completely protocol agnostic verification tool. But I believe for the try-based approach, you, you should have wildcard at the right side of the fields, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, another uh, related question then, if I may, uh, is um, could you give th some examples of properties that you cannot verify uh, yeah. using your technique? So uh, with, with this technique, we can, for example, verify uh, performance properties about the network. It's mostly, uh, you know, properties on the path and uh, the header of the flow in the network. So uh, the, the examples I gave are kind of representative of the type of thing we can check. We can check loops, we can check black holes, but for example, we can't uh, check that, uh, you know, this rate guarantee is, is actually maintained in the network. Those require more information that's not available here. Thanks. I had one more question. You hinted at the beginning about the possibility of maybe being able to use it in non-SDN networks and mentioned one of the difficulties in that was collecting the updates. I was wondering what happens in terms of the sort of cascading effects that you might see in non-SDN networks and transient uh, loops, delayed convergence, things like that. How does that end up playing out? Uh, so. Uh if I'm, if I understand your uh, your question uh, uh, correctly, uh, your your question is about how we can detect these in the non-SDN uh, network when it's a transient uh, property. So, for example, if our if the way that that we are checking these properties is by getting snapshots, we totally miss uh, a loop that is uh, happening just between the, the snapshots that we are taking. If we have a, a SNMP trap kind of approach. Again, if the loop is less than the verification, last less than the verification time of net plumber, then we miss it, but otherwise we can capture it. So the typical update time, then well, we miss it. Uh, Jinda from Google. Um, uh, can kind of uh, support uh, the policy like say, I want enough resilience uh, between two, p two nodes that it can tolerate any single link failure. Mm -hmm. So how, how can the HSA be adapted to, to that? So uh, for example, in that case, we may uh, want to verify that there exist at least two paths between any two nodes. Maybe we can, we can translate that policy into this equivalent path constraint, and depending no. on how, how complicated that policy is. Yeah, it's more like the dependency graph may get uh, complicated, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you.